Welcome to another episode of That's Some Crazy Shit with Kelly and James. I am Kelly and my co-host is James. What is up, my sister? What is up? You know, you know same all. Yep, you know, it's things are good. I cannot complain. I'm excited today, James, because we have like a really cool guest. You know, we tend to um, have a lot of psychic mediums on the show. They're yeah, all very good. I don't think we've encountered yeah. anybody that's not what they say they are, right? They've all been I, very good. And very today accurate. is no exception. So today we have um, psychic medium John Russell. You want me to tell you about him? Yeah, give me some info. All right. So John has been a psychic for um, almost 50 years. I believe he said he's going on 50 years. And he's a he's a psychic and he's a paranormal investigator. Um, he wrote a book called Writing with Ghost Angels and the Spirits of the Dead. Um, and I did read some of that. Did you? He has this fantastic yeah. book. Um, it's available on Amazon. And he's been a psychic for a very long time. And I can't wait to hear his story and how it all came to being. And I just, I've, I always like talking to psychics, so I'm excited. Let's bring him on then. All right, let's do it. Welcome to the podcast, psychic medium and author, John Russell. John, thank you so much for being on That's Some Crazy Shit with Kelly and James. We are excited to have you here. We love when psychic mediums stop by and because it's some crazy shit, the things that you guys experience. But I won't take up I won't uh, take up all the intro. I'm gonna let James kick it off. He wanted to start with the questions and we're just gonna have a fantastic conversation. So welcome, John. We appreciate you stopping by and talking to our listeners. Um, I started reading your book that you had sent and the story that it starts off with about the Hearst. I yes. can't I can't believe that's just coincidence. Oh, absolutely not. I was guided to that. Absolutely, I was. So tell so us about talk? what, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm all like, what Hearst? I'm sorry. Tell us yeah. about what you're talking about. <laughs> A quick rundown of that story for our listeners. Absolutely. Well, let me tell you, Kelly James, first of all, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I appreciate you guys having me. And uh, the um, what happened with this, this story in my first book, which is titled Writing with Ghost Angels and the Spirits of the Dead, came out in September of 2020. Um, I had shot a TV pilot for the History Channel, and which unfortunately never aired. And um, in the process of shooting the pilot for the History Channel, the objective of the pilot was my psychic investigation of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And I got to go to all these wonderful, fantastic places, Ford's Theater and the Peterson House across the street where Lincoln died and so on and so forth. So I got to experience all these wonderful, fantastic things. And in the midst of that, I had this absolutely overwhelming desire to find Lincoln's funeral hearse, the whereabouts of Lincoln's funeral hearse. And I asked my producer and he had no idea. And I think I asked several other people and they had no idea. And for some reason it became this irrational obsession with me that I wanted to find Lincoln's funeral hearse and I couldn't. So we wrapped up the investigation. That was that. And then, uh, a few years later, a year or so later, we moved to Florida. And uh, when I moved to Florida, I got my my next uh, my next motorcycle. I've been a biker since I was about 15. And I got my next motorcycle and I ride a lot. So when I say I ride a lot, at the, at the time I was riding between 1,500, 1,800 miles a month, every month. Yeah, a lot. On the current bike, I have almost 114,000 miles now. And that's just on this bike alone. So I love to ride and I would schedule myself days off and take long rides, 500 miles round trip in a single day, stuff like that. And so I started getting this psychic prompt to ride to Florida State Capitol where we're living now, which is Tallahassee. And that's all the guys would tell me. I, I call the, the people on the other side, my guys, my guides, my angels, and so on and so forth. My umbrella term is the guys. 
So that's all the guys would tell me was ride to Tallahassee. I said, okay, I'll ride to Tallahassee. So I checked the bike out and get everything packed up, hit the road. And uh, as I get almost to Tallahassee, there's a sign that uh, for the Tallahassee Automobile Museum. And the, the voices are like, here's your destination, turn in here. And I'm like, wait a minute, what? You know, have I heard this wrong? I, I thought I was supposed to go to Tallahassee, into Tallahassee and figure out what was going on there. But like, no, this is the destination. So they had me head to Tallahassee, get almost into it to see this sign and, uh, and realize that was my destination. So I get off the bike, uh, park in the parking lot, get off the bike, and uh, I suddenly just get really homesick for New York. And all of a sudden then, as I'm walking into the museum, the TV pilot comes rushing back to me and I start thinking about that for some odd reason. I'm thinking, man, this is really turning out to be a crazy day. So I pay my admission fee and I, I start to look around the museum. Now I'm a bike guy, not, a, not really a car guy that much, although I did have hot rod cars when I was a kid and I loved them, but, uh, and I appreciate cars, but I'm a bike guy. So I'm still bum fuzzled. I'm like, why have the guys had me ride all this way to go to a car museum? Well, it's not just a car museum. They have tons of things in there, sports memorabilia, knife collections, outboard motor collections, all kinds of crazy things. It's really neat. So uh, as I pay my admission and I turn to start looking at the automobiles on the lower floor there, the vintage cars, I immediately see and know why I've been brought to this destination and why I received the prompting to come. And I recognize what it is from across the room and it's the funeral horse that drew Abraham's Lincoln that carried Abraham's Lincoln body. It's a horse drawn funeral hearse and it's the hearse that carried Lincoln's body. And man, you talk about getting chills. And so I made my way over to it real slowly, just appreciating the fact that they had led me there. And I stopped and stood before it and I was like, my God, you know, somebody on the other side knew where the hearse was and knew it was important to me. And it took a move across the country and years later and a trip of almost, you know, 300 miles one way to, uh, to get there and to discover it. But there it was. And uh, my mouth was agape. And <laughs> I mean, I, I actually looked around the museum to see if the ghost of Lincoln was standing there looking at me and smiling, you know. And uh, if he was, I didn't see him. But I, I gave thanks for... Uh, for the experience and what it taught me and what I wanted to, it to teach my readers was that there are these powerful unseen forces on the other side that they hear us, they listen to us, and they can guide us and uh, bring closure into our lives or bring us into the knowledge of things that we need, help us develop our intuition, protect us. Uh, give us ideas for great inventions, things like that. So that was the lesson that I drew from that. And uh, it, it was definitely not coincidence. I was definitely led there. And it made this wonderful closure for me uh, from that moment from so long ago when I was like, where is Lincoln's funeral hearse? Why does nobody know where Lincoln's funeral hearse is at? I was and surprised it, by that, yeah. Yeah. That is and, very cool. So John, how long have you known that you've had this gift of being psychic? Since I was about five or six. Wow. And yeah. so when did you start like reading for people? When did that come into play? Well, I started reading for people when I was around 12. And uh, I continued to study and learn everything I could. And uh, I read for friends and family. And I was so good that by the time I turned 18, I had people driving a couple of hundred miles one way to get readings with me. And uh, I had developed, you know, quite a, quite a bit of a good reputation there. And so by the time I was 18, then I started reading professionally instead of just doing it gratis for everybody. You know, up to that point, I had just done it either completely free or if somebody wanted to give me a donation or whatever, I did it that way. But uh, you know, as, as time went on, I realized, hey, I've got the, I'm not charging for the gift, but I'm charging for my time, you right. know, and, and I realized, hey, I've, I've got to, if I keep doing this at this level, uh, you know, I'm going to have to, going to have to charge for it. So then I started reading professionally at age 18 and uh, I'm 67 now and next year it'll be 50 years I've done this professionally. Wow. Yeah. So I'm always interested, um, 
how psychic mediums do their readings and and because everybody seems so very different but the same as far as you know a feeling is it a feeling that you get is it a do you see um people who have passed on do you hear what is like your your thing do you know what i'm trying to say all of all of the above and then some but i think the um the easiest way, and it's it's so difficult to try and describe exactly how a reading works. I get that information, but uh, and it's a it's a poor definition I can give you at best. But the best way that I can describe it is during a reading. Uh, it's like when we went to school and we learned that two plus two equals four. That's a fact, and we learn we can take that fact and go anywhere in the world, and two plus two equals four. So it's a thing that we can absolutely hang our hats on. And that's the way the information comes to me in a reading. It's like it comes to me as a fact that I already know. Like it's, if it's like embedded in me, like the fact that I know two plus two equals four, they give me this, they provide this information to me in such a way that it's like a fact that I already know about people and all I have to do is parrot it to them, repeat it to them, tell them it. And if I get the information that way, it's something I can always tell people, look, you can take this to the bank. And, uh, you know, if it's uh, over the years, my clients have told me I've been anywhere from 80 to 90% accurate, uh, which is pretty impressive. But look, let's take the 80%, which is still pretty impressive. But if I'm right 80% of the time, I'm wrong 20% of the time. So out of, out of every 10 questions, two of those are going to fall through the crack and they can be pretty big questions. So no psychic is perfect. Okay. Right. And so that's why I say that, uh, you know, I've, I have some allowance for, for some leeway with my clients. They'll tell me, what do you think the chances are of this happening? And unless the other side gives it to me in a concrete way, they'll give it to me in like, well, 70, 30 at this point, you know, and I'll tell them that. But sometimes the other side gives me things that are so clear cut, cut and dried, so firm that it's like, this is going to happen this way, no matter what you think about it, whether you believe it or not, no matter what you do or don't do, this is coming down. So here's how to prepare for it. Here's how to get ready for it. That, that is cool. Um, yeah. It's, Kelly, it's and I've, Kelly and I have talked about how people don't listen to the young and the old. Right. When, you were, when you were young and you were telling these people you were having these experiences, I mean, you were 18 when you started doing it professionally. Did you find out that people didn't believe you when you were young? No, they actually uh, did listen to me. Uh, I had developed enough of a reputation that people knew my reputation for the accuracy of both my insights and my predictions. Uh, so they did listen to me. And uh, there was uh, enough people that had seen uh, I, I made predictions for their lives that were short range, medium range, and long range. And they would see what I had predicted come true. And a lot of people were like, you know, a lot of people go to psychics and there's goofy, phony psychics or, or bad amateur psychics that make predictions and they never happen, all this kind of thing. So they were kind of used to that. But when they came to me and I made predictions, they actually happened. They actually came true the way I said they would. And people were like, oh, wow, okay, something's going on here. And uh, so even from a young age, I, I had people paying attention to me. Now, when I was really young, if I can digress, if we have time, I'll go back and tell you exactly how all this started. The portal that opened this up. The, um, I was five years old and I was uh, sound asleep in my bed. My parents had a nightlight on in the hallway so that I could, could uh, see down the hallway if I had to get up at night or whatever. So I'm laying in bed and I'm sound asleep and I instantly pop wide awake. And I'm like, well, this is crazy. What in the world is this about? So I thought, well, maybe there was a noise or something or, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe, uh, maybe some sound outside or something woke me up. So I laid there still, I didn't hear anything. And I thought, well, this is really weird. So I just raised up on my elbows in bed to kind of look around my room, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, when I did, in the glow of the nightlight from down the hallway, there was this elderly black gentleman staring around the door, peeping around the door into my bedroom. And I screamed bloody murder because I was five years old. My family was white. We didn't have anyone black living with us. My dad was a racist. So we actually didn't even have any black friends. So I presumed somebody had broken in the house. And when I screamed, he walked around the doorway, walked down the hall, walked closer to my bedroom. 
and I can describe him to you. He was absolutely solid. He wasn't misty, wasn't translucent, wasn't transparent. He was as solid as you or I, full-bodied as you or I. Dressed, I can tell you, he had close-cropped white hair. He had a white mustache which indicated to me that he was elderly, appearing as an elderly gentleman. He had on a red flannel shirt, khaki pants, black belt, and black shoes. And the closer that he got to me, I screamed bloody murder that much the louder. And he was not menacing in any way at all. His look wasn't benevolent. If anything, he was kind of bemused, kind of like, golly, listen to this kid wail. And I, as my parents began to come running, he began to then get translucent, begin to get transparent, and then he disappeared from the feet up to his head, kind of like the Cheshire cat. That's the best way I can describe it, and he vanished completely. So my parents came in, and I said, there is somebody in the house, someone is broken in the house, even though I'd just seen him vanish. And uh, my mother held me and tried to comfort me. My father, I was so convincing, I was so scared that my father actually went around the house, checked all the doors and windows, looked under the beds, looked in the closets. Of course, nobody there. And then I realized I had just seen my first ghost. Well, I was like, no, why did this guy come and scare me to death in the middle of the night? And is he gonna come back? And is he gonna talk to me? Is he gonna ask me to do weird stuff? It's like, what's the deal? And as time went by, and it didn't take very long for me to understand this, as time went by, I understood that he came to open up the portal to all of these paranormal experiences that I would have later in life, and physically manifested paranormal experiences. And he also opened up my psychic gift in the process. So he was the greatest blessing I could have ever had in my life because he came to open this up, to give me, to activate this gift, to open this portal. And it was like, you know, kids, sorry to have to scare you like this, but this is how it's done. And down the road, you're gonna help a lot of people and you're gonna have a lot of amazing experiences. So it was fantastic. And I can truly honestly say that since that time, I've never been scared of any paranormal occurrence, any manifestation that I've experienced. So that was really the, the opening of the portal to the, the physical paranormal manifestations and then to the awakening of my psychic gift and the way that I uh, figured out that that had come about was then shortly afterwards when I was between five and six I was outside playing in the backyard and this car pulled into the driveway I didn't recognize so I ran in I got my parents I said hey there's somebody out in this car in the driveway I don't know who they are so my parents came outside walked out to the driveway and they went oh these are friends of ours we know them I said, oh, okay so they got out of the car and they come, they were all standing talking outside, talking to my parents. And I was playing with this toy, kind of standing there, eavesdropping, listening to them a little bit. And all of a sudden I just had this, this, this vision, this epiphany. And I said, I just butted in the conversation, just interrupted everybody. And I said, you people just went on vacation. And I said, you drove that car that's in the driveway. And I said, you took two kids with you. They're not with you now, but you have kids, two kids. And you took them in that car with you on this vacation. And you went to this hotel and it looked like this and it was painted this color and there was these certain kind of trees in the front evenly spaced along and then in the back pool area it looked like this there was a blue pool and white chairs and all this and the husband of the woman was just kind of <laughs> looking at me like this and and uh, kind of with his head cocked and kind of grinning silly and and the woman i will never forget her expression god i loved it she had her mouth wide open, her eyes were bugged out, and she was looking at me like I had cobras crawling out of my nose. And she looked at my parents and she said, how in God's name could he possibly know this? And my, my dad was like, be quiet, John. And I just kept going and, and she said, how in God's name could he possibly know this? And my mother said, well, you know, kids' imaginations, you know how kids are, and she goes, it's not imagination. He said, we went on vacation. We took that car with our two kids and stayed at this place that looked exactly like he described. How in the hell is that possible? How in the hell could this kid possibly know this? And my mother said something like, well, you know, I, then go play, John. <laughs> it was like, I was like, okay, nice to meet you folks, bye. And this woman kept looking at me with her eyes bugged out, staring at me like I was the craziest thing on the planet. And that's when I discovered that I could see into people's lives, I could read their minds, I could predict their futures, I could, could see all these things about people and uh, made a, a bad impression on them. They never came back to visit again. <laughs> so John, let me ask you a question and I've asked psychics this before. So you have this gift, 
You can right. see things, whatever. Is it something that you can turn off? Is it always on? Are you always picking up stuff? Or yeah. is it something that you can just turn off? It's always on. It's uh, ever since I acquired the gift as a kid, it's been on 24 seven. And uh, I grew up with it and I'm so comfortable with it. I would never want to turn it off. Uh, but I, I don't think I, I could if I tried. I don't think that's possible for me. Right. And, uh, and I, I enjoy living this way. It's, it's, a, it's a great life. I'm comfortable with it. I'm used to it. And uh, like I said, nothing scares me. I've had well over a thousand physical paranormal manifestations. And what I mean by that, I don't mean these are things that I dreamed or meditated or quote unquote channeled or envisioned. I mean, these are things that happen on the physical realm that a lot of times other people witness them, we audio record them, we video record them, we photograph them. So these are real things that happen. Uh, I'll give you an example, like, like yesterday, I was on a podcast and this crash came from within the house. I was the only one home and uh, this crash came from within the house so loud that the, the host heard it over my microphone. <laughs> and I said, did you hear that? And she was like, yeah, what in the world was that? I said, just the guys saying hi, just the guys letting us know that they're here, that they're manifesting themselves. And so I have all these kinds of things happen, you know, continuously, and I always have had, and uh, nothing has ever scared me, nothing's ever, now I have been startled, if I know I'm alone in the house by myself, I turn around, somebody's standing there, I go up, and, and they disappear, and I'm like, oh, okay, but I've never, never been scared again after that. That's crazy. So yeah. I have a question for you. So since you say that you are in contact with people from the other side, I have to ask you, what happens when we die? Because all these well, people you're talking to are are dead, right? So dead, right. What, yes. did that, yes. have you ever asked that question or have they ever told you like, where are they? What happens? Yeah. Well, it's a funny thing because there are these, the best way I can describe it is kind of like firewalls between our side and the other side. And we get some information and some ideas, but not the absolute total complete picture. Why that is, I don't know. But what I have been able to ascertain from the spirits that have died and gone across over the years, uh, they let me know that, they let me know what death is like and what they, what one spirit gave me the analogy of was, you know, people are always saying, well, send them to the other side or send them to the light or whatever, they're stuck here on earth, which is nonsense. Um, the, the spirit told me, he said, this is what it's like to die. He said, imagine you're driving your car. You know you're in your car. And if you pull your car over and stop and open the door and get out, you know you're not in your car anymore. And he said, that's just exactly how it is to die. You know, you're not in your body anymore. You've left the car, you pulled the car over, stopped it and got out. And so, you know, you're not in your body. You know, you're on the other side. So yes, people know they've died. People are aware that they've died. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's this argument about earthbound spirits or they're trapped or sent to the light or whatever. And what I've been able to get from everyone that I've communicated with over the years is that people choose where they're gonna hang around, for how long, for what purpose. Um, they, um, what we don't understand, if we have an encounter with a spirit, and let's say that encounter lasts five minutes, which would be incredibly long, really. But let's say we have a five minute encounter with a spirit, and then we make the assumption, oh, that spirit's stuck here, they're hanging around here, whatever. Well, look, if I meet you on the street, and I say, Kelly, how's it going today? And we talk for a couple of minutes and then here comes James. Oh, James, how you doing? And, and we talk for another few minutes and then I get in my car and go. My, my whole day hasn't been spent there with you. I've spent five minutes with you and I'm gone. I'm off doing something else somewhere else. And so we have to understand that about the spirit realm as well. If they spend a few minutes with us, they're not stuck or trapped or whatever. They've chosen to be there. And when they're gone, they're going about their business. We still have things on the other side, life lessons to learn, other things to learn, uh, spiritual progress to continue to make, things that we're involved in over there. So we have this assumption, this mistaken assumption that if a spirit comes to us and it's like, oh my, they're, they're, they're stuck or they're hanging around or they're trapped or whatever. No, they came to visit and now they're gone. They're doing something else, just like me. You know, I spend five minutes with you. Now I'm going. I got the other 23 hours and 55 minutes of my day left, you know. So it's, it's kind of like I that on the other side do, as well. Yeah. And uh, I also have been shown very clearly that they do hear us. They do see us. 
Um, you know, they can like for clients, there's been people that said, Hey, tell them I saw them bring flowers to my grave or put the stone on my grave or, you know, do something or whatever. Uh, so they do see us. They are able to watch us. They are able to hear us communicate with us. Um, they know what we're doing. They know what's going on. And, uh, so it's, uh, that's, that's pretty much the, uh, what I've been given. And as far as what it's actually like on the other side, uh, the best I can describe it that I've received is that there, there is a feeling that they portray that they have consciousness of a body of some type because they still feel like they're in some kind of dimensional body. And then of course that body is not limited, you know, with time and space and everything like we are, it, it can, uh, can move about very rapidly, very freely and, and it will, and is in a different I guess, plane of vibration, if you want to describe it that way, a different type of dimension in that regard than we are. And um, some people are, are more adept at learning how to break through that veil and come back and communicate with us that are here than other people are. But uh, that's, that's basically what I know. And, and anybody that tells you, well, here's what life is like on the other side, exactly in explicit detail, they don't know. You know, it'd be like me telling you how it is to live in China, and I've never been there. And I start right. spouting off, this is how life is in China every day. I don't know. I haven't been there. So, you know, when we get to the other side, I remember there was this old preacher I knew one time, the only preacher I ever knew I thought had any sense. And he used to tell everybody all the time, he said, when we die and get to wherever it is we're going, heaven or whatever you want to call it, he said, all of us are going to be so shocked. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's probably the truth of it right there. We're going to get there and just go, oh, I, I didn't know it was going to be like this. I thought it was going to be like yeah, that. No clue, huh? Right. Yeah, that, yeah. And that's why I asked, because that's just a question that's just hanging out there because, yeah. it, you know, nobody really knows. So I just want to know really if, if the spirits have ever told you. So I do have one, exactly. one more question for you, because I love to ask this of psychics, because I'm sure. fascinated with what y'all do. You say that you never turn your gift off, it's always on. Right. Can you read anything on me or James? <laughs> well, let's see. Let's see, let's see. Let's I see. always go there with the psychic medium, some James, because, and everybody that we've had thus far has been incredibly accurate, I will say. They really have, yeah. Fascinating to me. With, um, with Kelly, there's some creative emphasis, impetus rather, that there's some creative force or creative energy there that's trying to get you to express it. And it, it seems like it's almost kind of like a, a big project, like a larger project, uh, almost like a life altering project in a way. Uh, and it would be something like increasing greatly the visibility of what you're doing and or becoming involved in something new or additional or something that you put on the back burner, maybe you've been thinking about for a while and it's like, okay, now's the time for you to do it. But it's a very creative process and it could be something, it could be writing, uh, it could be um, something, any, anything in the creative area like that. But it seems, whatever it does, it seems to communicate something to people. And it's uh, it's a like a, a, a bigger project than what you've done in the past. It's like it has like a, a bigger- Like a media company? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I only asked because somebody else told me that exact same thing. Yeah, right? it feels like it has a, a bigger energy and a bigger impact yeah. and reaches more people. Listen, listeners, so that's, yeah. follow yeah. me. Get yeah. with me in the future, James. There you you better, go. better stick with me. What about there what about go. my what about my good friend over here? Yeah, well, well, Kelly, don't forget about me then, because when you get big, I want to be right there. Come with on, you, so. I'm me bringing too. you with me. I'm gonna need yeah, me you to too, tell man. me. I'm gonna need both you guys to be on my team. Absolutely. I, I will be there. I will absolutely <laughs> be there. No question. I will absolutely be there. Okay, now let's go to our buddy James. <laughs> um. There's somebody on the other side, a relative of yours you lost that's on the other side that you really feel wistful about when you think about them. Who would that be? My mother. Okay. She, um, do you feel sometimes, I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but do you feel sometimes kind of like you let her down or that you weren't 
quite as in sync or involved with everything as you wanted to be for her or feel like maybe you didn't quite fulfill things in the way that you wanted to for her? Yes, that's true, yeah. John. Yeah. <laughs> and what she wanting you to know is that um, you you did everything right, she says. Wow. She says you, she says you did everything right. She said, in your mind, you're almost seeing yourself as a failure sometimes because in your mind, it wasn't extravagant enough or big enough or generous enough or large enough. And she's saying that, God, I almost want to cry. The emotion is so strong. She says that everything you did was the, the greatest gift to her heart that you could ever imagine. Wow. Yeah. That means a lot, John. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That is fantastic. And you know, it's really funny because um, other psychics have had, like um, in James's house, we've had psychics tell him that his house is a portal, that yeah. his house has vortexes, that his house has many spirits coming and going. It's like a gateway right. almost in right. his house. And so um, I think it's great that your mom came through, James. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah that was hey, I, mom. Your mom's very happy with you, okay? That's nice to know, John. That's yeah. always been a question I've had. So, yeah. John, I got to ask, as a biker, a, a, a psychic biker, <laughs> right? Like this, yeah. I mean, when, you know, because bikers have a certain stigma, right? A certain oh, God, stigma yeah. against bikers and everything. So yeah. are people surprised when you say, hey, I'm a biker and also I have this ability? They do, yeah. They're, they are surprised, exactly. And I remember I was on one podcast and the host had the picture of me up there in, in promo. And one of his friends said, he doesn't look like a psychic. He looks like a hell's angel. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but, but bikers do have that stigma and particularly uh, people that are in clubs. And uh, the uh, I'll tell you, you'll, you'll never meet, uh, you know, there's good and bad in, in every genre of life but you'll you'll never meet a, a bunch of more good-hearted people than bikers uh you know we're we're usually the first ones out there for the charity runs and we're the first ones to make the big donations and and uh, that type of thing and i think that um I'm, I'm not praising bikers and elevating us up and i'm not saying we're all perfect because like i say there's good and bad in everybody but i think one of the things about bikers is that most of us have lived pretty hard lives uh, been been pretty close to the earth and uh, really struggled to find out the truth and we've really seen uh, how life treats people from various uh, you know uh, uh, layers of life from various uh, statures status of life and we've learned uh, how to judge people and we've learned to, to see bs real well yeah i bet uh, i bet John, I appreciate you so much being here with us today. It's been fantastic what you do. If people wanted to reach out to you and get a reading, do you read through Zoom or over the phone? Well, I do phone readings and uh, they can contact me for phone for phone readings. They can visit my website, johnrussell.net. And that's got all the information on scheduling and reading with me, how to do that and so on and so forth. And, uh, and I'm always taking new clients and the wait time, unfortunately, right now is getting that close to five months. Wow. But, uh, yeah. Wow. But, uh, always happy to have new clients, you bet. Absolutely. Well, we'll make sure to put all the information in the podcast description. I have incredibly enjoyed having you with us today. Oh, um, I think right. what you do is phenomenal. I think what you do is phenomenal and I just, I can't say enough about it. Oh, bless your heart. I appreciate it. It's been great to be with you guys. It's been a lot of fun and uh, we'll have to do it again. We definitely want to have you come yes. back. Yes. And if you're ever in my neck of the woods, John, on one of your trips, stop in. I'd love to buy you a drink. Oh, bless your heart. I'll take you up on that. Absolutely. And, and Kelly, keep me in your mind there when you're getting rich and famous. Uh, hey, you yeah, know what? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need that media company that you said you're go. seeing. I'm going to need you on my team. So most definitely. We'll be there in you touch. Go. We'll, we'll make a power trio right here. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, John. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, you know, Kelly, that was that was pretty intense.
it was pretty emotional. Um, what he said about my mom and that was, that hit home. I had been thinking that for years and to get the answer to finally kind of help me get over that. That's pretty intense, man. Were you thinking that any times like recently? Had you been thinking that? You know, it's funny, guy. I think I, I probably think about that a lot, to be honest. Do you? But I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't think I've even told you that. No, you didn't. And you don't, but you don't verbalize it, but you think it. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, always been in the back of my mind. And then to have him say, you know, I did a good job. And, you know, that really means a lot to me. And just how emotional he got. It really got Yeah, he said that he was, you know, so emotional that he felt he might cry. Yeah, that's intense. That is intense to feel all that emotion, right? The love um, he said that he felt, the emotion that he felt that your mom has for you, I thought was crazy. It's some crazy shit. And then that's the second person that's confirmed some type of media company. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but damn it, we're going to figure this shit out, James. And don't forget, forget Entourage. <laughs> I won't leave you behind. Yeah, don't forget the little people, man. (laughs) I won't leave you behind. So wait, I did have a question that I just wanted to quickly go over and for random bullshit before we wrap it up, because I've been thinking about this and I I may have asked you before, but maybe not. Maybe I asked you and I told you not to answer me. So my question is this. Do animals have consciousness? Like you had talked about, you know, sentient beings and that was us because we are aware, right? Right. And my question to you was, well, aren't dogs and cats and everything else, isn't they aware too? Because isn't everything just energy? Isn't that what everybody's ever told us? Everything's energy down to the littlest, tiniest insect to us. Everything's energy. Would you not like to think that everything is conscious or just going through the motions? Well, no, I think, I believe everything is energy. I do believe that. And we talked a little bit about this. And like I said, I believe some animals are conscious of their being. You know, I think dogs, cats, I think mammals tend to be. Um, You know, I don't see uh, carp being aware of itself, but I don't know, you know. Um, but we had talked about too how you know if your energy if you're you know everything's energy and everything has an aura and we talked about crystals have an aura so are, are crystals alive they give off an energy everything is energy so if everything is energy then everything is alive they say right. everything is energy even the even the inanimate objects like the chair and the table are right. energy right? right so everything is alive so this is my question and so you believe some mammals are but not all creatures like spiders or bees or ants you don't believe them to be aware or conscious that they're a spider a bee or an ant or they're just the things that they do are just instinct i believe things like insects yes are mostly motivated by instinct but I don't know enough about them, you know, I don't, can you train a bee? Well, I saw this video where these two bees unscrewed a bottle cap to a soda. See, and that's beyond instinct. So I'm saying, so are they aware? Well, I don't know. Do you think they're having a conversation like, hey man, hey, help me get this cap off. Yeah, because the inside is going to be really good. It's sweet. It smells great. All I right, don't so, know. Yeah, tell me what I'm up. saying. So, like, like I told you, I had a spider that lived in my window, and I like to think that the spider was like Charlotte's Web, and it lived up there because that's where it chose to live. Where you tried to dash my my hopes and said maybe it was just good hunting ground, but I like to think that the spider was aware enough that it chose that place. My friend, I don't dash your dreams. I support them. Remember Entourage. I'm just saying. Okay. But what I'm saying is, you know, I've tried to be 
not necessarily the devil advocate, but you know, maybe a different point of view to, to kind of generate discussion. I just wonder if all animals and insects are aware. Are they conscious? Because you said they weren't sentient beings and I say we're all aware and we're all conscious down to that spider. I even like to think that flies are aware. I like to think that flies bug you on purpose because they know it pisses you off because they're little pricks and they know that they're they know that they're only going to live for a short period of time so I think they just do it to get their jollies because well, that's good, good, man be nice but I think that a lot of people think that otherwise I don't think we'd have cartoons and movies that show these bugs and animals talking and living lives like we do that's why I think we have movies like that because we like to think that they're all aware okay that's just my thing I just I was wondering it's just one of those random thoughts that just ran through my head I thought I'd throw it out there no that's cool like I said you know generate discussion I don't you know now you know I'll have to sit and think about it because you know what is your definition of sentient being then what is your definition of you know being alive you're the one who said it. That's what that's what made me think about it. You're the one that said we were, but they weren't. So I just said, well, are they? Well, I'm just looking at it a little deeper now. You know, so I don't know. But while you're thinking about that, remember that you can get us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We have a website. We're on YouTube. www.thatsomecrazyshitpodcast.com will lead you to all of our social media links. Will also lead you to all of our past episodes. James, we're almost out of time. It goes by so fast. It does. And, you know, we just get started and then we have to stop. Then we have to go until next time. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you. I, I always appreciate the time that we spend together. I do uh, too. It's thought provoking. It is thought provoking. Next week, another guest. Uh, some more crazy shit as usual. So until then, people, keep your minds open. <laughs> <laughs>